بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على حبيب المصطفى وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا سبحانك لا علمنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت الحكيم العليم اللهم انشر علينا رحمتك وأنزل علينا حكمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام بفضل الله وبرحمته with Allah's grace and his mercy we are going to conclude today our discussion of Surah Fatir. And as we mentioned in the beginning of the surah, this is a chapter that has very unique phrases and very unique ideas that are have become part of the Muslim lexicon. Um, and it's also a very beautiful segue, all of this culminating in Surah Yasin. And so as you know, next Sunday, it's the weekend of Thanksgiving, so we don't have any halaqa, but it allows us perfectly that we can start with Surah Yasin, inshallah, immediately following that week. <clears throat> so last week we talked about the incredible reward of Al-Jannah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the statement of the people entering into paradise that all praise is due to Allah who has removed all sadness, removed all anxiety. And <clears throat> this is interesting because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not only talking about the physical delights of Al-Jannah, which we went into great detail when we mentioned the commentary of Surah Al-Rahman. We talked in detail about what the <clears throat> rewards are in Al-Jannah and what people will receive physically. But here Allah is not talking about something which is physical. He's talking about something which is emotional. In another verse, وَنَزَعْنَا مَا فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مِنْ غِلْ Allah removes and lifts from their hearts any feeling of rancor towards others. This is one possible interpretation. So that anxiety, sadness, rancor, regret, all of the negativity that a person harbors within their heart, it's all removed. So part of the reward of Al-Jannah, to put it very simply, is that you don't have to worry anymore. We spend our whole life worrying about things. Either it is, <clears throat> one of the very famous phrases in the Quran is, لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون. So no khawf and no huzn. Why khawf and huzn? What do we fear? Fear is always about things which will happen. Fear is directed towards the future. So when Allah says, La khawfun alayhim, it means that they know that only good things will happen to them in the future. So it's about the future. Walahum yahzanun, nor do they grieve. What do we grieve about? Things that have already happened in the past. So, لا خوف عليهم ولا يحزنون It means that they don't worry about anything which has already transpired and also they don't worry about anything which is going to happen. So part of the reward of Al-Jannah, part of what makes the reward complete is not having to worry about anything. So we mentioned that last week. The reason I mentioned that is because it sets us up for this week's discussion. Because then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the punishment. وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَهُمْ نَارُ جَهَنَّمَ And then Allah mentions how the punishment of the hellfire is not only physical. لَا يُخَفَّفُ عَنْهُمْ It will never be decreased. So the punishment of the hellfire, it only increases. وَلَا يَزِيدُ الْكَافِرِينَ كُفْرُهُمْ Illa maqta. One time it's mentioned maqta, another one it's mentioned illa khasara. But why is that important? Because the person who knows that the punishment is increasing, فَيَمُوتُ So they die, but they don't really die. فَلَا يُخَفَّفُ عَنْهُمْ مِنْ عَذَابِهَا So that, it's the knowledge that the punishment is not going to decrease. Actually, in that moment, what disbelievers will wish for the most is to just die. And that's one of the great ironies because that's generally the thing which we fear the most in this world is death. And the thing which we fear the most in this world 
will actually be their greatest wish. That they wish that they could just die and be over with it. But they can't. They will la yamutuna fiha. As Allah mentioned the Quran, they will not die in the hellfire. So they know that it's going to repeat. So just in order that they can sense and feel that punishment, Allah will recompose their body and give them new skin. Why? Because the skin, of course, right underneath the top layer of skin is where all the nerve endings are, in which you can sense all of that pain. Then the regrets will begin, of course. And they will wish that they can go back, they can live differently, right? They say, oh, just give us a day. Just, we just need a little bit of time. And they even have a game plan about what they're going to do. They're going to say, فَأَصَّدَّقَ. This is normally mentioned as the number one regret. Is that I was too stingy with money. I did not want to give out in sadaqah. I did not want to contribute. I did not want to give to the poor. I didn't want to give to the masjid. And I will be from the righteous believers. The thing that's interesting about this ayah is Allah mentions that if they were sent back, what would they end up doing? They would actually, even with the knowledge, because their nature is the same, right? The person's nature is the same. So even though the issue was not the knowledge, because now they have experienced, they have witnessed what's going to transpire. But Allah says that if we were to send them back, they would do exactly the same thing all over again. Because the, the heart is still corrupt. And as a result, their actions would be exactly the same. Then Allah mentions, In Allah yumsiku samawati wal arda anta zula. One of the very beautiful verses of the Quran, that Allah is the one who suspends all of the heavens and the earth and prevents it from falling apart. This is also scientifically, we won't go too deep into the scientific element because it's beyond my comprehension, but it allows us to reflect that, you know, when you look at a picture of space, it looks like, okay, everything is just static. But when you read these verses, you have a different perspective that actually everything is in motion and there are gravitational forces. So when people were reading the verses years ago, they, they probably didn't understand. What does that mean that Allah is suspending something in space? Now that we have that knowledge of centripetal force, of gravitational forces, of black holes, now we can revisit this ayah and look at it from a completely different angle. It makes sense. That there are all these different forces in the universe all pulling in different directions and everything is perfectly balanced. So one of the greatest and then the beautiful thing about this ayah is that You know, sometimes we don't pay enough attention to those verses that in Allah Ghafoor Rahim, Hakim Alim, right? We sometimes we just continue to the next verse. There is a lot of depth of meaning in there. Allah mentions that He is Halim, that He has Hilm, that He has forbearance, that Allah is patient with us and He is forgiving. How is Allah patient with us? Now we're switching into another topic, which is about why is it that Allah does not punish the wrongdoers? Look at all the evil in the world. لا من شيء. Nobody can overcome Allah. Nobody exists outside of his power. But they arrogate themselves. They continue to plot. So why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not punished them? That is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala withholds the punishment from those who are deserving it. Allah does not mete out justice immediately. And then in the uh, towards the very end, kasabu, that if Allah were to truly to unleash that punishment, 
If he were to give them what they really deserve and what they have earned, there would not be any living thing on the face of the earth. There would be nothing remaining. Right? Like uh, Dr. Tariq mentioned on Friday, that Nuh, after 950 years of da'wah, his life is, let's say, about a thousand years, he's preaching to his people. Al fasanatin illa khamsina ama 950 years. Then he makes this dua that la tadhar ala al ardi min al kafirin dayara. That don't leave anyone behind. Inna ka in tadharhum yudillu ibada ka wala yalidu illa fajran kafara. Even if they have children, the future generations are going to be even worse. They're going to be disbelievers. They're going to be wrongdoers and evil people. So what did Allah do? Allah He opened the skies and unleashed all of that punishment. And that is just a small glimpse as to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could do to punish everything. Because Allah says that when Allah sends down his punishment, it doesn't get delayed and it doesn't get advanced by even one hour. And how does his punishment come? It comes down sayhatan. Wahida. It always comes in a single blow. <clears throat> because what people keep saying, they said, Oh, why doesn't Allah send down punishment? If what you're saying is true, why hasn't Fali Muyadibuna? So why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not punished us? The fact that we're comfortable and we're going about our day and we're worshiping Hubal and Uzza and Manat, that means that. The idols must be right because we haven't been punished yet. There's no lightning coming down from the sky. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set up a perfectly balanced and merciful and just system, which is not based on punishment in this world. We can discuss this further, inshallah, also in the discussion. Because <clears throat> we have a tendency, actually we discussed it last year, but it comes up a lot especially since COVID, sometimes there's an earthquake and people say, oh, it's because of this, it's because of society, it's because of this sin, it's because we haven't done anything about this issue facing the ummah and people have a long list of why Allah is punishing us. And so <clears throat> sometimes it is possible that these kind of natural disasters come down as punishment from Allah. But the same incident, I think somebody's there. The same incident, which can be a punishment for one group of people, can also be a mercy. <clears throat> this is why the hadith that was shared during the plague that happened in Syria, um, Sa'ad, uh, no, not Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, Abu Ubaidah ibn al Jarrah. Uh, when he interacted with Umar ibn al-Khattab, he said that the Prophet ﷺ had said that it is a curse for the disbelievers and it is a rahmah for the believers. So how is it possible that a natural disaster could be two things in one? The reason for that is because whether something is a curse or a mercy depends on your response to it. Everything which brings you closer to Allah is a good thing. And everything which takes you farther away from Allah and closer to his wrath and his anger is a curse. And so there are many people who became closer to Allah as a result of difficult times and there are others who became farther away. And so that is determinative. So today, inshallah, we're starting from ayah number 36. And concluding at the end of the surah, 45. Uh, I won't recite because of my voice, but I'll give you the translation, inshallah. As for the disbelievers, they will have the fire of hell, where they will not be allowed to finish by death. Nor will its torment be lightened for them. This is how we reward every stubborn disbeliever. There they will fervently be screaming, our Lord. Take us out and send us back. We will do good 
unlike what we used to do. He said, we're going to be totally different. We're going to be different people. You won't recognize us. Then they will be told, Did we not give you lives long enough so that whoever wanted to be mindful could have done so? And the warner came to you. We'll talk about who is the warner. There's a lot written about that. So taste the punishment for the wrongdoers have no helper. Indeed, Allah is the knower of the unseen of the heavens and the earth and surely knows best what is hidden in the heart. He is the one who has placed you as successors on earth. So whoever disbelieves will bear the burden of their own disbelief. The disbelievers' denial only increases them in contempt in the sight of their Lord, and it will only contribute to their loss. Ask them, O Prophet, have you considered your associate gods with you invoked besides Allah? Show me what they have created on earth. Or do they have a share in the creation of the heavens? Or have we given the polytheists a book, which serves as a clear proof for them? In fact, the wrongdoers promise each other nothing except delusion. Indeed, Allah alone keeps the heavens and the earth from falling apart. If they were to fall apart, none but him could hold them up. He is truly most forbearing, all forgiving. They swore by Allah their most solemn oaths that if a warner were to come to them, they would certainly be better guided than any other community. Yet when a warner did come to them, it only drove them farther away, behaving arrogantly in the land and plotting evil. But evil plotting only backfires on those who plot. Are they awaiting anything but the fate of those destroyed before? You will find no change in the way of Allah, in the sunnah of Allah nor will you find it diverted to someone else. Have they not traveled throughout the land to see what was the end of those destroyed before them? They were far superior in might, but there is nothing that can escape Allah in the heavens or the earth. He is certainly all-knowing, most capable. If Allah were to punish people immediately for what they have committed, he would not have left a single living being on earth, but he delays them for an appointed term. And when their time arrives, then surely Allah is all seeing of his servants. <laughs> so the first topic which we need to handle is the punishment of the disbeliever and what their state will be in heaven, in hell. And we mentioned <clears throat> in the summary that last week we talked about paradise. And notice how in the Quran you have this duality. The Quran is al-Mathani. It has a dualistic nature. Actually, the number, if some people are, I'm not into the numbers, but some people have done statistical analysis of the Quran and the numbers of verses that talk about punishment are exactly the same as the number of verses that talk about reward. And the number of times that Jannah is mentioned is exactly the same as the number of times that the hellfire is mentioned. So it shows that fear and hope should be balanced, right? So Allah, this is very similar to the ayah in which Allah says, wherein he will neither die nor live. لا يموتون فيها ولا يحيا. This is very powerful. <clears throat> that means that they will have a consciousness, they will have an existence, neither are they living nor are they dead. Right? So they're only existing for one sole purpose which is to receive the punishment. So this is a very terrifying thought if we reflect on it. Then uh, there's a hadith in Sahih Muslim that as for the people of hell who will dwell therein, they will neither live nor die there. And then Allah says in Surah uh, Az-Zukhruf that وَنَادَوْ يَا مَالِكُ لِيَقْضِ عَلَيْنَا رَبُّكْ قَالَ إِنَّكُمْ مَاكِثُونَ so it says in Surah Al-Zukhruf, Allah says, and they will cry, who's Malik? Malik is the angel assigned as the keeper of the hellfire. His name is Malik. And the name of the angel is mentioned in the Quran, right? So there are certain people like Jibreel, for example, who are mentioned in the Quran. So they will say, Ya Maliku, liyaqadi alayna rabbuk. That let your Lord make an end for us. So they are begging the keeper of the hellfire, please just kill us. Just be done with it. Be over. And then how does he respond? 
makithun, that you will abide here forever. Because when they think about death, they're thinking, okay, that will be a time of rest, but it's impossible for, for it to happen. In the same verse, Allah mentions, wa alaikum لا يفتر عنهم وهم فيه مبلسون لا يفتر عنهم It's not going to be lightened for them. وهم فيه مبلسون They will be overwhelmed. They will be overtaken by despair as a result. Then in another verse, Allah says that whenever it decreases, it abates. Then زدناهم <clears throat> Then we will increase it for them. The fierceness of the fire. فَذُوكُوا So taste you, no increase we shall give you except in torment. So in this case, notice how they are calling Allah. They are praying to Him with the sincerity that they were never able to pray with in this world. And they are using phrases that they never used before. They're saying, Rabb, that our Lord, Rabbana, <clears throat> bring us out. In this verse it says, نَعْمَلْ صَالِحًا we're going to do righteous deeds. Which they recognize that we weren't doing it before. We're going to do, we're going to be, you won't recognize us. We'll be totally different people. Right? Then Allah, he mentions, So he knows that if he were to send them back to this world, they would go back to exactly the same things that they were forbidden. And he knows that they're lying, so he doesn't respond to their Plea. A warner came to you. So Imam Ahmad, he reported a hadith from Abu Hurairah that the Prophet said that Allah has left no excuse for the person who lives to be 60 or 70 years old. And then the Prophet repeated again and again three times Allah has left him no excuse. Allah has left him. No excuse. So why is this mentioned? Especially the age of 60. That Allah removes the excuse from his servants. The reason for this is there are various hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that the age of 60, and in some cases it's mentioned between 60 and 70, as the usual age for people in this ummah. Now of course, life expectancy has increased over time. In the hadith of Abu Hurairah, the Prophet ﷺ said that the usual lifespan of my ummah is between 60 and 70 and only a few persons will pass this age. So what that means <clears throat> is that, you know, if we have passed that age, we are on additional extra time, right? It's like, uh, well, nowadays everybody's in soccer mode, right? So <laughs> we're in overtime. All right. So the, the, the clock has already ended. So now we have some extra time that Allah has given us. So now we have this opportunity. So you know that it's limited. So you're going to want to do the best that you can with the time that you're given. And the warner came to you. Now, there are two possibilities, I think. One of them is that the Prophet وسلم, or the Anbiya, the Prophets came to you. There's another possibility, which is which was also prevalent in the Arabian Peninsula, is that when they said that a warner came to you in old age, what is the warner of old age? The warner of old age is gray hair, right? Um, so a lot of a lot of the mufassirin they said that it means that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala causes this cycle in which our bodies become go through the aging process in which we become a little bit weaker, we start having health problems, we have gray hair. All of this are the little signs and indications for us. Because if Allah kept us at our full strength, then we would actually have more arrogance with Allah. But because Allah weakens us a little bit and it happens gradually, so it's just as a reminder that, hey, you're not going to be here forever. So it's like a little bit of a tug, you know, just to bring you back. And so all of this is, and Allah mentioned in the Quran, that he created us min da'afin, and then after from this da'af, then min quwa. Then he made us strength. He made us strong. 
then Allah yuraddu ila arda lil umar then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after min ba'di quwwatin da'afan wa shayba again the gray hair is mentioned so after strength then Allah causes you to be weak again and he also gives you gray hair now of course it could also mean the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that means that you live long awalam nu'ammirkum meaning that Allah caused them to live long enough it could be specific to the quraysh that Allah caused you to live long enough in order to meet the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then there would be a connection between an-nadhir and nu'ammirkum and how uh, this ta'mir in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extended their lives and this is the view which is preferred by Imam At-Tabari ibn Jarir because that is consistent with the meaning and then of course what is their response going to be they're going to say yes indeed Allah did send us a, a, a warner and this is also actually the, one of the main topics in surah yasin that a warner did come to us in antum <clears throat> uh, that uh, anyone that the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down um, except that you are only in great error so every time they're sent with a warner they deny that warner and they end up in complete error so taste you for the wrongdoers there is no helper this means taste this punishment of the fire because you went against the prophets in your deeds and today famalakum now you have no helper from the fate of punishment then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about the unseen right here allah tells us that in allah alimu that allah knows in another verse ghayb as-samawati wal ard he knows all al ghayb excuse me which is interesting because our iman our faith is also in al ghayb alladhina yu'minuna Everyone knows the verse from Surah Al-Baqarah. So Allah knows the unseen in the heavens and the earth. He knows all that is heaven and He knows all He knows the secrets of the hearts and He tells us that He's going to reward or punishment, punish everyone according to those disease, according to their, um, according to their actions. Then Allah says, He is the one وَالَّذِي جَعَلَكُمْ خَلَائِفَ فِي الْأَرْضِ so there are two meanings here. He made us khala'if. So khala'if, one, it means that we are khalifa. That means that we have been entrusted with a responsibility. The other thing which reminds us is that one day we're going to leave. So who are the khala'if of us? Our, the next generation. Our children, our grandchildren, they are our khala'if. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he made us with this nature that, it's, that other people are going to inherit you. That means your houses are not your own houses. Everything that you own, actually they belong to your inheritors. So he is the one that made this succession of generations and all people succeed another person and make you inheritors of the earth generation after generation. فَمَنْ كَفَرَ And whoever disbelieves on him is his disbelief. So everybody, وَلَا تَزِرُ وَازِرَةٌ وَزْرَ أُخْرَى so each person is responsible for their own choice and their own actions and the consequences of that. Now, this is also, we shouldn't read this ayah in isolation because don't forget which ayah is coming up in the end. Is about, co is about collective punishment. So what is the problem with collective punishment? If Allah punishes everyone, what's going to happen? There will be some people who deserve that punishment and there will also be some people who don't deserve that punishment. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is al-adl, who is perfectly just, he created a system based on judgment. And so the only reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done collective, afalam yasiru fil ard, right? Look at the past civilizations. Why those civilizations existed? They existed as a ibaratan li ulil albab. They exist as lessons, but they're not part of the grand scheme. The grand scheme and design that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set up is based on individual punishment and reward. And these examples of civilizations that have been destroyed is intended so that their remains would be left behind. 
that the artifacts would be left behind so the future generations can learn from that. They can take lessons from that. They can avoid the way in which they ended. And the disbelief of the disbelievers adds nothing illa maqta except for hatred of their Lord. And the word which is used is maqt, which is a very, I don't know, how do you translate maqt? <laughs> it's very hard. The only way you can really understand it, does anyone know what maqt was in the time of, the, of Quraysh? This was a jahili practice that when a man would die, what would happen to his wives? You know? I told you it's a very, very despicable practice. His wives would be inherited by his sons. This is called maqt. And the Jahili Arabs, they knew that this is backwards. They knew that this is crazy. So they called it maqt, which means despicable. <laughs> and that was the practice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he doesn't use any word by accident. Everything has a meaning. So it only increases them in, in, in that hatred. Illa maqta. وَلَا يَزِيدُ الْكَافِرِينَ كُفْرُهُمْ إِلَّا خَسَارًا Except in lost. So the longer they persist in that disbelief, they are actually generating more hatred of Allah towards them. And the more that Allah hates them, then the longer they're going to be in the punishment and the more that they and their families are going to lose on the day of resurrection. Now this is very important. Because Allah here says uh, in the earlier verse, Awalam nu'ammirkum. Did we not extend your lives? So then Allah mentions how rather than waja'akum al nadir, so rather than extending their lives being a cause for them to reflect, what did they do with the extra time? What were they doing with this extra years that they weren't supposed to get? Were they reflecting? Were they doing dhikr? No, they were getting worse and worse. They were getting worse every day. They're getting farther and farther away from the truth. So that means that <clears throat> when Allah hates someone, one of the ways in which he punishes that person is to extend their life. Because that person is, is only digging their hole deeper and deeper and deeper. And when Allah loves a righteous person, subhanAllah, it's exactly the same thing. But the situation is the opposite. When Allah loves his servant, sometimes he extends the life of the servant. Why? In one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said that when Allah loves his abd, he sweetens him. Right? The word which is used is halawa. Right? It's a very unusual hadith. That Allah sweetens them, right? And the Sahaba, did they understand what the Prophet meant? They didn't, as far as we know. They said, Ya Rasulullah, what is this sweetening that you're talking about? Then the Prophet told the companions that he inspires him to do good deeds. Allah continues to allow that person to live again and again, live to 60, 65, 70, 75, 80, 85, 90, you might be in the situation that I'm describing. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put you in a sound mind, even though you're going up in age. This is a blessing from Allah. That is a blessing because every day that you live, you are benefiting because your book of good deeds is getting longer and longer and longer. So if you make use of that time, even though there are other people who that, whose that is a curse. They're losing and losing and losing more. For the believer, it's the opposite. That's why one of the dua that we say, that, oh Allah, make our hayat as yadatan fi kulli khair. Make every day an increase in all good. And let death be a peace from us from all kinds of harm. Right? Because then we do more actions which are beloved to Allah. Then quickly we'll mention the helplessness of the false gods and the power of Allah. Then Allah mentions, did you look at your partners, what they have created? Do they have any share in the heavens? We mentioned earlier, they don't even own the membrane, the wrapping of the date seed. Do they have a book 
Do they have any proof? No. يَعْدُ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا غُرُورًا They only have غُرُور. They only have delusions. What are غُرُور? Allah is warning us from following our whims. Dr. Tariq on Friday, he mentioned a hadith that I quote all the time. Um, both of us mention it all the time. That no one will truly believe حَتَّى يَكُونَ هَوَاهُ تَبِعًا لِمَا جِئْتُ بِي that no one will truly believe until your own ahwa, your own desires, what you want is in agreement with the message that the Prophet came. So people, they read the Quran and they're not satisfied. They're frustrated. They're like, why do we have to do this? So that feeling of frustration is a sign of distance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's natural. You should reconcile that. If you have that, ask questions, learn. Investigate, understand it. But you're, know that your iman is incomplete. It's not that when the Prophet says, La yu'min, it doesn't mean that you don't have iman. It means that your iman is incomplete. So you have to work on it. So sometimes when we have these discussions or when we uh, review what's in the Quran, we start making opinions which are based on our personal preferences. And we should be cautious because we need our aql. We need our mind. We need to reflect. We need to think. We have to engage with the Quran, with tafakkur, with tadabbu, with deep contemplation. But in order to arrive at what? To arrive at what Allah is communicating to us. Not to arrive at our own feelings of what is correct and what is not correct. So it is a very subtle difference that we should always be aware of and cognizant of. Then Allah tells us of his mighty power in which all of the heavens and the earth are suspended with and the forces that he has placed which are holding everything very precariously together. And then Allah mentions that if he were to move away from their places that there is no one that could grasp them after him. He is the most forbearing and off-forgiving. Why? And this is the main point that we're going to be concluding on, which is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every day sees the disbelievers. He sees his creation disbelieving in him, disobeying him. Yet Allah is patient. He gives them time. He waits. He even gives them a chance to see if their heart might change. He doesn't hasten the punishment. He even conceals their faults and he forgives them. إِنَّهُ كَانَ حَلِيمًا غَفُورًا He is most forbearing of forgiving. Now the sins of the human beings are enough. Why Allah is mentioning punishment and the suspension of the heavens and the earth? That means that our sins, brothers and sisters, are so great and so numerous that they are enough to cause the universe to shake and to disintegrate, and to fall apart. That is how much the sins of the human being are. And yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not allow that to happen. Now, of course, the, the Quraysh, they had made an oath. They said that if a warner comes to us, they said that we are going to be the most guided. Now, this is the... I can only when I hear this ayah, I can only think of one person. Do you know who I'm thinking of? We're going to be the most huge. We're going to be the biggest. We're going to be the best. Uh, well, Fir'aun, that's a good one. But I was thinking of somebody more more contemporary. <laughs> so this ayah is just like Donald Trump, right? Because they said that well, we're not believers, but if we were believers, we'd be the we would be the best believers. We won't be regular ones. We're going to be the the biggest ones. We're going to be the best believer. That we're going to be the most guided of all of the nations. So they are trying to impress each other based on pure hypotheticals, things which they're not even doing. And they are making oaths, swearing up and down, trying to impress each other. Making these grand declarations. And actually, these declarations, it's recorded in history that they made these public declarations with all of the tribes together that 
if a warner, this is before the advent of the Prophet this is before the message of the Prophet all the tribes came together and they all made an oath. They said that if the Prophet comes, as has been prophesied, we are all going to follow him. Then the Prophet came. And the same people who took the oath didn't do so. Right? As Allah says in another ayah, that if the, if the Arab pagans used to say, if we had a reminder, as had the men of old, we would have indeed been the chosen. We would be min ibadillahi al-mukhlasin. We'll be from the chosen servants of Allah, but they disbelieve therein, so they will know. Law an oh, here's the ayah I was looking for. Law anna indana dhikram min al-awaleen, la kunna ibad Allah al-mukhlasin. This is from Surah Al-Safat. Right? They said, we are going to be from his most sincere, we're going to be the best servants of Allah. But rather, istikbaran fil ard wa makra sayyi. Because of their arrogance, they were too arrogant to follow the signs of Allah. Wa makra sayyi. And the plotting of evil. Wala yahitul makra sayyi illa bi ahli. So the evil plot, they make plots against Allah, but what ends up happening with their plots? They end up being the victim of their own plots. They end up, the evil consequences of their plotting, it comes back on them. So what about the sunnat al awaleen? The way of dealing with the peoples of old, it doesn't change. And then this takes us to the consequences. So Allah says, O oh Muhammad, say to these people who disbelieve in the message that you have brought, travel in the earth, see the punishment. There are at least a dozen times in the Quran. In which Allah says, go travel the earth. They were much stronger. They had more power. In another verse. They were highly civilized, highly developed societies. Look how their homes were empty. Look how they lived in luxury. And everything has been empty. They lost everything. We talked about the people of Saba. Everything was washed away. They had so much wealth and so many children, but none of it, la yu'ajizuhu, none of it could protect them in the slightest when the punishment of Allah came. Surely he's all-knowing and all-able. Uh, all now all of Surah Fatir, in my view, is concluded in this final ayah. Um, all of the ideas and thoughts, they all culminate together. There's a conclusion in Surah Fatah to the whole surah. In which Allah says that if Allah were to punishment based on bima kasabu, what they deserve, what they have earned, then he would not leave a moving creature. Now, uh, one of the commentaries from Asuddi, he said that he would not leave a moving creature. It means he would have stopped sending rain to them. All of the animals would have died as a result. So it doesn't only mean that Allah would actively punish them. It means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would prevent the things which he's doing which cause us to continue to exist. Because we only exist by virtue of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decree. But rather he gives us a respite. Until the day of judgment, he rewards those who obey him and he punishment punishes those who disobey him. So every moment Collectively, as a human beings, as mankind. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished us collectively for what we have done, we would not exist on the face of the earth. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us mercy every single day that the sun rises. That's a new page, as we mentioned yesterday in the janazah. We have a janazah today, inshallah, as well at 2 p.m. Everyone. Uh, is welcome and invited to join us. And mm -hmm. yeah, well, that doesn't mean you can't come. Sure. Well, if somebody would like to come, the janazah is at 2 p.m. Doesn't change it. Um, so, <clears throat> so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like the hadith, every day that the sun rises, there's a new act of appreciation. There's a new act of sadaqah. There is a new thanks which is due on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because he's giving you a new day. 
a new opportunity in which you can write whatever you want. You can be better than who you were the, the previous day. And for that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deserves all, all, all thanks. Next week, inshallah, we're going to talk about Surah Yasin. Surah Yasin is the heart of the Quran. Uh, two weeks, yes. In two weeks, because next week is Thanksgiving. Jazakallah. So next week, it, we're off because of Thanksgiving. And then the week after, so two weeks from now, we're going to talk about Surah Yasin, which is the heart of the Quran. And I think most of us, this is our favorite uh, chapter of the Quran. So let's open the discussion, inshallah. I have the uh, Zoom open as well. In case there are any questions. Yes, this is a move. We should get a microphone. So there is a hadith that uh, Allah extends a per person's life. And then is it uh, what to take authentic, whether it is the punishment or to do the righteous deeds? Mm -hmm. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has a divine wisdom, not only about the things which have happened, but all of the things which could happen. And the things which could never happen because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees the person to die, for example. So, for example, we might see a very righteous person at the age of 35 and pass away. And everybody would say, that's so sad. It was such a good person. There's so much they could have done with their life. Right? And we would have been sad. We'd say they're, they're still in the height of their youth and there's so much they could have done. But maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from his divine wisdom wanted to take his righteous servant in the moment of obedience. And he knew that this person would get farther away from him as he becomes older. So he wanted to take his life while he was in the best position and closest to Allah. So it looks like something bad, but in reality, it was a rahmah for that person. Then we might have another person. We see that the person is suffering from an advanced stage cancer. And the person is in their 70s and in their 80s. And we might get frustrated that, oh Allah, just take his life. He's suffering. He's going through this hardship. Then that person goes in Yawm Al-Qiyamah and he sees mountains of good deeds. And he says, oh Allah, what are these good deeds? I never did any of these good things. And he said, this is the reward for your patience. Because I afflicted you with this and I gave you this, this, uh, this illness and disease, and your iman was not shaken. Your faith was not shaken. So now here is your reward. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to extend, and that could have been someone who engaged in a lot of sin. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sweetening that person, bringing them closer, and making sure that all of the punishment the person experiences is in this world. So that way, when they go in the Akhirah, they don't receive any punishment. So as a human beings, we are incapable of determining whether what the wisdom is in whether we have a short life or a long life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might give someone a long life and it could be a curse. And he might give another person a long life and it might be a blessing. And so it really depends on that person. And what they do at that time, that is the most important factor. So there is another question about this, uh, that uh, when a, a wife dies, she is uh, inherited or she was inherited by her son. What does that mean? So that means that after they had this, this is of course, Jahili, this is before Islam. This is um, what it means is that a son would marry his stepmother after his father passed away. That was the practice that not only would he inherit the money and the houses, but he would also inherit his father's wives. And of course, this is a very, it was, this was something, of course, which was forced on these women. Uh, and it's a very ugly thing. And the Arabs, they, the, the Jahili Arabs, they also realized that. That's why they called it maqt. Otherwise, they would give it a nice name. <laughs> Otherwise, they knew that this is very backwards. 
Yes, this is a good point. That in uh, the, the Pharaoh, uh, in ancient Egypt, they had the same practice. Yeah. Any other thoughts? There are several references to Allah Hafun Arahim Allahum Yes. At different parts of the Quran. Mm -hmm. um, I was just wondering um, whether this is strategic mm -hmm. uh, points mm -hmm. where there is adversity mm -hmm. here, and uh, that's one aspect. The second is um, it's a related issue mm -hmm. where you mentioned about suffering and people go through this. Mm -hmm. And you know, we have several people in the community who have gone through adversity, difficulties, disease, and so on. Mm -hmm. And the families, of course, grieve a lot because yes. they are worried that the person is going through uh, all this cancer and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And some way of consoling them is to say that all the suffering that you have undergone here yes. will be compensated yes. when you pass the, to the other world mm -hmm. um, because Allah is merciful. Right. Uh, these are some of the thoughts and I just thought I'll mention them and seek your your direction on that mashallah very beautiful um with regard to the first one la khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahzanun there are two points to consider one is the technical aspect the technical aspect is that when allah says that they have no fear and they have nothing to grieve it means that they are from a very very exclusive category of people because Allah will only say la khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahzanun for people who don't receive any punishment. And we believe that all believers will end up in Jannah. But it doesn't mean that they won't receive any punishment. It's possible that people will go to the hellfire for some time. And then they will go to the paradise. After they have paid for whatever sins they have committed. But when Allah says la khawfun alayhim wa yahzanun, then it's conclusive. That means these people don't receive any punishment of any sort, of any quality whatsoever. They go straight to Jannah and they don't receive any, uh, any punishment. So this is the technical aspect. Then there's a stylistic element, right? There's a second thing to consider, which is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions these at specific points in the Quran where either the Prophet or the believers need reassurance. That whatever hardship you're going through, whatever difficulty you're going through, whatever adversity you're going through, Allah has reserved a very special category of reward for you. That not only will you have complete ease, but you will have emotional ease. You will have spiritual ease. You will have psychological ease. That in the akhirah, you're not going to have to worry about anything. And so this is a beautiful expression of love from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That not only is he telling you that, oh, you're going to receive your reward, but also the afterlife is going to be the opposite of your experience in this world, mm -hmm. in which you have to overcome hardship. Over there, you're not going to have to think about anything. With regard to the second question about adversity, you know, the Prophet ﷺ, he said that no affliction affects the believer, even a thorn that touches the believer except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recompenses them in the afterlife. And so in fact, there are people, there's another hadith that people will wish that they had received all of their punishment in this world. So there's two possibilities, right? Uh, so to go a little bit deeper. So if one of it could be that Allah is giving you some adversity because all of us, we have shortcomings. We have some sins that we committed. So Allah is allowing you to pay for that in this world. Why? So you enter into the Jannah in a state of purity because all of your sins have been paid for. The other possibility is that Allah is reserving a special category of as of the patient people. Why? 
because every reward has a distinct, discrete amount of reward. If you if you say alif la mim, you get the reward for three words, right? And Allah multiplies it 10 times, so we can say you have 30 hasanat, right? And so on and so forth. If you pray, you have a certain amount of reward. But Allah says about patience, innama yuwaffa sabiruna ajrahum bighayri hisab. Allah rewards for patience without any accounting. So the, the second possibility is that Allah might be reserving. He knows that you're going to be patient. He knows that your faith is not going to be shaken. So it is a matter of, 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 of raising your maqam with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah is giving you adversity in order to lift you, in order to raise you, in order to make you better. So two possibilities are there. It could be to pay for some sins or it could be to lift you to enter into the akhirah in the best state. And it could be both at the same time too. It doesn't have to be one or the other. So this, is, this should give people a state of reassurance. And usually it's the family members who struggle. Because my experience, of course, for over the years, we have visited hundreds of people in the hospital. And so many people who've gone through uh, cancer and other terminal stage diseases. And I am always amazed at how patient they are, how accepting they are, and how, especially when they're surrounded by people who remind them of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that uh, what beautiful perspective they have. But as family members, it's hard to watch another person that you love to go through that experience. So that's why we have to gain that perspective and understanding that we were not created for this world. We were created to live for the Akhirah. Once you have that as the starting position, then everything else in life makes sense. Any others? Assalamu alaikum. If we were not created for this world and we are created for the other world, it mean, doesn't mean that Jannah is there forever, for Abada. Doesn't mean the, the, the hellfire will also remain forever. As God says, They will never be absent. Doesn't mean it, the hellfire also remains forever, side by side of the, of, of the, of, of the paradise. This is a big topic, actually. You know, in um, there's a lot of scholars who are actually contrary to what we all believe that have the opinion that the hellfire is not for forever. Um, but there are verses in the Quran that they will be khalidina fiha, that they will be there for eternally. But theoretically, they're saying, well, it cannot be infinite, right? Because there's still time still exists. Um, but I'm inclined to think that that it is infinite, but only because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extends its time. So even though it's a problem theoretically as a practical matter, they will be, continue in the hellfire forever. So there's some difference of opinion. Some people, they said, no, there will be a time in which the hellfire will end. Um, but I'm inclined to think that, no, it is eternal. Because this is how I read the verses of the Quran. That they will be there khalidina fiha. And some verses khalidina fiha abada. They will be there forever eternally. And that the hellfire. So they said that they will be there forever. But it doesn't necessarily be that the hellfire will continue indefinitely. But I think this is contrary to what the verses indicate. So Thank you. Thank you very much. Any others? It's a very tough subject and also I can do some more research on it. A lot of it is philosophical because the textual evidence in the Quran is, uh, if you take it at face value, it says forever. So forever means forever. So then you stop, then you don't ask any more questions. <laughs> But then if you dig a little bit deeper that can anything exist forever? I mean, does it exist within time? No, it's different. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as Dr. Tariq mentioned on Friday, Allah is outside of time. 
only Ibn Taymiyyah, he had the view that there's time with Allah. Otherwise, the Ash'aris, Maturidis, the other believers, we believe that Allah exists outside of time. Um, I agree with what Dr. Tariq said. I have the same view. But what about the hellfire? What about Jannah? These are all circumscribed by time. So if something exists within time, what does forever mean? So it's a hard question to answer. So I'm not sure I know the answer. But I know what you what the, the, the Quran says forever. So this is a good place to start, right? Yeah. But it's... Uh, I mean, there's a reason that some of the scholars had different views because it's not that obvious. It's not that simple. So I think it, I think for us as Muslims, this should be enough for us. That Allah says that it's going to be forever. What that means about time, we don't necessarily really need to know. Because as a practical matter for the person who is in it, they're in it forever. So they're not going to care whether it's forever and is it whether it is an infinite loop or whether Allah continues to extend its time. For them, it's the same thing. They're in it forever. So what difference does it make? It's a purely theoretical exercise. I think there was another question, no? Okay. So I think... Uh -huh. I just have an unrelated uh, point to make. Uh, we talked about um, suffering and anxiety on the part of uh, people. And there are also people who are sick. And uh, I can mention this, uh, you know, we had the, the sad passing of uh, our brother Osman. Mm -hmm. And Osman knew that he was sick. Yeah. Um, and he was a very close friend of mine. Uh, may Allah have mercy on him. Amen. But he kept saying to us, Every time we spoke, please ask dua for me. Please mm -hmm. ask dua for me. Um, and here was a person who uh, knew that he was uh, ill and sick. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think he expected to pass so early. However, he kept emphasizing uh, the request for dua. Mm -hmm. I just want to share that thought with him because that's what he said to me two days before he passed, right? So um, the reason I mentioned it also is the power of dua for those mm -hmm. of us who remain mm -hmm. and who, who go to see people who are sick, um, that, uh, that there's, there is a great benefit yes. in doing that. And uh, the reward is not only for the person who is asking, but also for the person who is giving. And I'd like to share that with sure. you and seek your guidance. I don't know if I can add to anything to that. It's the only thing I'll mention is that when, when you visit the sick and you make dua for the sick, then they also make dua for you. And the dua of the person who's sick is mustajab, is answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ready. Readily, And this is from the practice of the Sahaba, that they would visit each other when they were sick and they would pray for each other. And this uh, becomes the reason and it facilitates the dua being answered. Because when you visit someone who is sick and in that condition, you're not seeking any worldly benefit. That prayer is coming from pure love. And the, the prayer that comes from pure love is insha'Allah is mustajab. It will be answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will grant it for your friend and insha'Allah will grant it for you as well. So the dua is can be very, very powerful and it benefits the one who is visiting the ill as well. This is a beautiful reminder for all of us that we should always seek to visit the ill, um, especially those with the terminal diseases those who we know and even those who we don't know. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the person who is sick, their dua is accepted. Right. Yeah. Well, you're going 
Well, you're going there to make dua for the sick person because the person who's sick needs the dua, right? Because they're sick, right? So you're making dua for their shifa and for their well-being, for afia, for, you know, all of that. But when you're there, when you depart, after you've prayed for them, then you'll say, oh, please also pray for me. So then their dua for you, it will also be accepted. Because that person is in a, is in a very precarious situation, that person is weak. The dua of the weak person, the mazloom, the oppressed person, the sick person, these are categories of dua which are readily accepted. Day of judgment, and um, Allah tells a slave, um, I was sick and you don't you visit, me. visit me. Yeah. And they say, What are you talking about? Uh, if I know about uh, how I know about you're sick and I don't visit you, he said, No, it's uh, you, this person who was sick, and if you go visit him, you'll say, How can I visit you? And you're your Rabbul yeah. Yeah. yeah, yes, and, he, and then Allah says that. Uh, my servant was sick and you didn't visit him. This is a beautiful reminder that, you know, we cannot see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we can visit through visiting his servants. And so visiting the sick, it's a very forgotten sunnah. You know, this is something like Abu Bakr was very, very attentive to visiting the sick people. So we should try our best to do so, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq Give us the ability to do so. May Allah heal all of those from within our community who are ill, those who are sick. May Allah give them shifa and kamil and ajil and la yughadiru saqama. May Allah also forgive all of those from our community who have passed away. Enter them into al-firdaus, the highest levels of al-jannah. May Allah cause us to be reunited in al-jannah in the company of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah remove all of the feelings of sadness anxiety, rancor, worry, uh, and all negativity from our hearts and enter us in al-Jannah in a state of purity. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Azim wa nafa'na wa iyaakum bil-ayati wa dhikri al-Hakim. Jazakumullahu khairan.